When it comes to the twin paradox, it can be hard to grasp just why there are so many explanations out there on YouTube, especially since no two solutions seem to be the same. In our recent series of videos, we've been taking a deeper look at this variety of explanations, discussing how they tend to be either misleading or straight up wrong. And so today, we're going to tackle one of the more sophisticated solutions. This is the inertial frames solution. Its proponents are adamant that it's the only correct answer to the twin paradox. But does it really resolve the paradox? Or is it just a fancier way of disguising the problem? This is Dialect with Do Inertial Frames Resolve the Twin Paradox? In our last segment, Solutions to the Twin Paradox Are Still Wrong, we tackled several varieties of incorrect or incomplete explanations to the twin paradox. We took a look at how space-time diagrams are misleadingly used to arrive at a solution. We also performed all the necessary mathematics to show that the paradox doesn't lie in the improper application of the Lorentz transformations. Advocates of these methods claim that the answer to the paradox lies in the fact that you can distinguish between the two twins' situations based on which twin accelerates. But there's a second school of thought that recognizes that this answer is insufficient, since you cannot accelerate without first specifying what you are accelerating in relation to, acceleration is, by definition, a purely relative affair. This means that each twin can restore the symmetry of the paradox simply by claiming that it is the other twin who is the one who is truly accelerating. To resolve this issue, the second tier of videos look for other ways to introduce asymmetry into the paradox. Their primary fallback is to invoke the concept of the inertial versus the non-inertial frame, which is technically what this video from Fermilab does. Forget the math and focus on one crucial difference. Observer A existed in one and only one reference frame. The moving observers existed in two. That's the only difference. Originally, we were going to review Dr. Lincoln's video in its entirety, but after watching it, we found it to be so imprecise and full of misleading statements that we really can't recommend it to anyone. The video can't even make its own case in a coherent way, so we're just going to sum it up for you. The claim made by Fermilab's video, as well as other proponents of the inertial frames resolution, is that the symmetry of the twin paradox is broken not by acceleration, but by the fact that, over the course of the twins' separate journeys, one twin occupies only one inertial frame, while the other twin occupies two. Another way of saying this is that, at some point during the journey, one of the twins inhabits a non-inertial frame. But what do such statements even mean? What does it mean to occupy an inertial frame, or one of them versus two of them, or one of them versus a non-inertial frame? What even defines an inertial frame? Most of us understand inertial frames through comparative examples, say, being in a car or train traveling at constant speed, or occupying a stationary school laboratory. Since these situations are characterized by their systems being at rest or traveling at constant velocity, it suggests that the simplest way to define an inertial system is by saying that it is a system which isn't accelerating. Let's see where this definition leads us with regards to the twin paradox. If twin A sits at Earth not moving or accelerating, she occupies the same inertial frame the entire time. Twin B, meanwhile, if he travels at constant velocity towards the turnaround point, reaches it, turns around, and travels back at constant velocity, will occupy two different inertial frames, one characterized by a plus V velocity and one characterized by a minus V velocity. He will also have to occupy a third non-inertial frame at the turnaround point whenever he accelerates or deaccelerates. The fact that he must occupy two different inertial frames, or equivalently, one non-inertial frame, while twin A occupies only one, is, according to the proponents of the inertial frame's resolution, what produces the asymmetry of the paradox and results in twin B being younger. Seems pretty clear, except that 
whoops, if twin B sets his coordinate frame so that he remains at rest at the origin the entire time, then he will only occupy one inertial frame, while the Earth and twin A will occupy two frames. Then twin A will experience the time dilation and not him. In fact, if you define inertial frames via the absence of acceleration, then to switch between two inertial frames simply means to accelerate, and the inertial frame solution reduces to your basic acceleration solution. But fortunately, proponents of the inertial frames resolution are smarter than that. Their definition of an inertial system doesn't rest on the notion of absence of external acceleration, but rather on the subtler notion of the absence of external force. Twin B, who fires his rockets, is said to experience a force at the turnaround point, and hence occupies a non-inertial frame during this time, while Twin A on Earth, who experiences no forces, remains in an inertial frame. This difference in experiencing force versus not experiencing force produces the necessary asymmetry required to resolve the paradox. This is what the switching frames resolution is really all about. The whole one frame, two frame formulation is just kind of a complicated way of saying that one twin experiences force while the other doesn't. Now, the distinction between force and acceleration is one that most people get wrong. If you spin yourself in a circle, you have perfect right to say that everything around you is undergoing tangential and centripetal accelerations while you remain at rest. This is because acceleration, like all coordinative descriptions of motion, is only concerned with relations between specified reference points. Force, on the other hand, though identified through acceleration, is assumed to be objective and should not be able to be transformed away with a change of coordinates. But there's a problem defining inertial frames through force. That is, as we just mentioned, force is not an observable and has to be identified through acceleration. This puts it, and consequently the concept of the inertial frame, squarely back in relative territory. To overcome this, you can, as we discussed in our prior video, Can You Feel Force, refine the definition of the inertial frame once more. This time, not to indicate whether or not your system is experiencing external accelerations or external forces, but to indicate whether or not your system is accelerating with respect to the rest of the universe. This is, for instance, how this popular video on the twin paradox from the TED-Ed series defines the inertial frame. To be an inertial observer, one has to maintain a constant speed and direction relative to the rest of the universe. But there's still a problem with this definition, because if we formulate the twin paradox in empty space, then there will be no rest of the universe for the twins to refer to, and thus no way to determine which twins' frame is inertial. So we have to cross that definition off too. Alright, but we can still rescue the objectivity of the inertial frame by appealing to another quality about force. Namely, that force is always attached to a source, since in our descriptions of the universe and our laws of causality, we always require that real accelerations stem from some physical source. Now here is where we'll split into different camps about the twin paradox. In the first camp, we assume twin A and twin B both have extensive knowledge of their system and can easily identify the emergence of a force through their comprehension of its sources. That is, if twin B measures twin A as accelerating and observes nothing else which could have produced this acceleration, while meanwhile observing his own rockets firing and being familiarized with the nature of his ship's fuel as a propellant, it will be reasonable on his part to conclude that he is experiencing force and therefore that he occupies a non-inertial frame. He could also make such a deduction by using an accelerometer, by a haptic feeling of force through his nervous system, or by noting some other phenomenon whose behavior he is readily familiar with. People who belong to this camp do not find such assumptions about the twins' knowledge to be problematic, and so for them, this is the end of the story. The paradox resolves itself here, with the materialization of force furnishing the requisite asymmetry needed to distinguish the twins' experiences. Their definition of an inertial frame, meanwhile, becomes implicitly characterized by an absence of any known force-producing sources that could be acting on the system. But if, like us, you belong to the skeptic camp, 
then you might see a pretty big hole in this solution. Identifying sources of force requires studying the behavior of different materials across a number of systems. This means your definition of the inertial frame has to be based on a certain amount of pre-acquired knowledge rather than being based in local observation. This is a big issue. Think about how it impacts the twins' situation. If their ability to determine the inertial quality of frames of reference relies not on observation, but rather on a prefixed level of knowledge, then we can easily recover the paradox simply by restricting what knowledge the twins do and don't have of their environment. If twin A, for instance, doesn't have the information to distinguish whether twin B's acceleration was produced by a force or not, then she will be in limbo as to whether or not she will see him aging rapidly at the turnaround point. Basically, this would be like saying that an observer's reality would be dependent upon, like, how much they paid attention in physics class. In fact, if we get rid of the twins altogether and replace them with systems of inanimate particles incapable of reasoning about the origin of forces, we might ask, how is this prior familiarity with the sources of force which is crucial for the resolution of the paradox, transmitted at all. That answer would seem to require an advanced theory of force-carrying particles applicable in accelerated frames, which we don't have. Okay, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. These are more complicated issues we will be talking about in later videos. For now, if you're seeking to understand the twin paradox at a deeper level, the answer that experiencing force or, equivalently, inhabiting a non-inertial frame, is what breaks the symmetry of the paradox, is certainly a much clearer and more satisfying answer than your basic variety acceleration solution. But it definitely leaves a few stones unturned and leads to questions that, from a philosophical standpoint, are rather troubling. So keep with us as we continue to investigate these matters in our future videos. This has been Dialect. Thanks for watching.